Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and recently I tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. I wanted to explain what that means, how the test is done, and why I'm not worried. As many of you know, I'm a professor at Columbia University, and with the back to work that started a few months ago, the university instituted a testing plan. I'm at the medical center. An area was set up here where people could be sampled, and you can go in and have a test done, or you can be randomly selected by the university to get an idea of who might be infected. On October 22nd, I was selected for a random testing. I went in that day and had the test done. And what it involves is going into this area. You have an appointment. Uh, they scan a barcode on your phone. They print out a label. They put it on a tube. And you go and you sit down at some caroled off desks. They're all separate, about a dozen desks separated from each other. And you take a Q-tip out of a sterile packet. You swab each nostril three times right at the front. Take the Q-tip, you put it back in the tube. You give it to the lady at front. She puts it in a box and then every day they're shipped up to the Broad Institute in Boston and they do the polymerase chain reaction or PCR. So this was on a Thursday morning. Friday night, I got a call saying that I was positive and that my CT value was 34 Point seven. So let's take a look at what all of this means. So let's take a look at where this virus uh, reproduces in us. So here's a diagram of the upper and lower respiratory tract. And the virus typically enters your nose. It enters these cells that line your respiratory tract, the respiratory epithelial cells, which are covered with mucus. The virus gets into these cells. It reproduces in them, and then the cells produce tons and tons of virus, which spread throughout the tract. In some individuals, uh, the virus spreads down all the way down to the alveoli in the lungs. And of course, there it can cause serious disease, COVID-19. So I sampled the very anterior part of my nostrils here. And so the virus is clearly reproducing in cells there. It also shows you why you can transmit this virus simply by touching your nose, contaminating your fingers with the mucus that you always have on these mucosal epithelial cells. And if it has virus in it, you could trans transfer it to others. The early tests for SARS-CoV-2 infection involved nasopharyngeal swabs. So you put the swab in the nose and you go all the way up into the nasopharynx, the top portion, and you rub it there. And that's very invasive, of course. So this little anterior nares sampling is, is, is welcome because it doesn't hurt at all. So when we sample the nose for SARS-CoV-2 with the Q-tip, as I just told you, what you're sampling is a mixture of virus particles and dead and dying cells. Coronavirus particle, of course, contains an RNA genome. So you could potentially have some virus particles on the swab. And the RNA genome is a very long RNA as shown at the top here. But you also have most likely cells, dead and dying cells is, that are present in the swab sample. And the dead and dying cells can also contain viral RNA as well as viral messenger RNAs. So when you do a polymerase chain reaction, you're going to be detecting both viral RNA and viral messenger RNAs. Now, the PCR primers that are used in the particular test being used here at Columbia, which is being done by the Broad Institute, are detecting the N gene right here. So it's all the way at the right end of the viral genome and the N mRNA down here as well. It's only a single primer set. Some assays use two primer sets for one gene, typically the N gene, maybe uh, the spike gene or some other gene as well. But it, the key here is that we're extracting RNA from my Q-tip swab. And the next step is to do polymerase chain reaction, which will only work on DNA. So the viral RNA on the swab has to be extracted and then converted to DNA. So here is the schematic of the polymerase chain reaction. We start with SARS-CoV-2 RNA, which is on my Q-tip. It's extracted, the RNA is extracted, then it's converted to DNA. 
by an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And then the polymerase chain reaction or PCR can proceed. And this is a diagram of what's happening in the PCR so we can understand what CT is, cycle threshold. So here is the DNA that was made from SARS-CoV-2 RNA. We put it in a tube with uh, the four nucleotides, A, T, C, and G. Uh, and we have the two DNA primers, which I told you in this case are specific for the N gene of the virus. And the first step is to separate the two strands of DNA by heating the sample. Now we have the two single strands. We then bring down the temperature so the oligonucleotides, the DNA primers, will anneal to the DNA. And then there's a DNA polymerase present in the mixture, which will then make a DNA copy of the DNA that we've put in uh, using those primers to start. So now we have two double-stranded DNA copies where we started with one. So we go from one to two, and that is one cycle one cycle of the polymerase chain reaction. And then it's repeated. The whole thing is repeated. You have these two DNAs that you've made. They're denatured, the, the primers anneal, and then you make more DNA. So after the first cycle, the second cycle here, you have four copies of the original target. And for each cycle, you double the number of DNAs that you have. And so you can see eventually, if you go 40 cycles, you can detect a very small amount of DNA to start with. So the cycle threshold, or CT, tells you how many cycles you need to get a signal. Now, a signal is typically read uh, on a machine. Uh, there are a number of ways you can do that. One is to use a dye called cyber green, which will insert into only double-stranded DNA, and then it fluoresces. So the cyber green itself is not fluorescent, but when it inserts into double-stranded DNA, which is a product of the PCR, of course, it will fluoresce green, and that can be measured by a machine. So at every cycle, at every one of these cycles, you could measure the amount of fluorescence. And so you could be incubating a sample, cycle one, two, three, et cetera, and then cycle 12, bingo, you get a reading of the fluorescence. That's your CT. Your CT would be 12. So my CT was 34.7. What could it mean to have a CT uh, of 34.7. Well, first of all, it's not very much viral RNA. Uh, we know already that a number of studies have shown that when you get into the high 30s, there's not very much RNA. And as I'll show you in a moment, there's very little uh, infectivity. On the other hand, a very low or a lower CT means there's more RNA there and you're more likely uh, to be infectious. So I had a CT at the higher end of the scale and typically these reactions are done for 40 cycles. I could have been at the very beginning of an infection. I might have recently been infected and it was just starting. I could have been at the very end of a asymptomatic infection. So the amount of our RNA is low in the beginning, it goes up and then it comes down. So here's a slide that Daniel showed on uh, TWIB 677, showing the different phases of SARS-CoV-2 infection. TE is the time of exposure, so that's when you acquire the virus. And the purple line is synthesis, the level of virus, say, or viral RNA. And then there's an incubation period, uh, and then uh, there is a period where the viral RNA starts to go up. And then there's TS is the time at which you have symptoms. So you can see the viral RNA peaks at or around the time of symptom onset. And then the viral titers decrease uh, in, in the next week or so. In terms of uh, CT values, you would have very high CT values here in the beginning, then the CT values would drop, uh, and then the CT values would go up again. So my CT of 34.5 could have been either at the very beginning of an infection, or as I said, at the end of a asymptomatic infection. So that's two of the possibilities to explain it. And the third possibility is that it was a false positive, of course, and that something went wrong, and I really did not contain any SARS-CoV-2 RNA. What, how, what would cause a false positive? Well, an error of some kind, if samples were mixed, or if samples were contaminated, or if I happened to contain uh, some nucleic acids that to which the primers hybridized and they amplified 
uh, some of my mRNAs, not viral RNA. All of those things could explain a, f a false positive. Now, here is a experiment that was published recently. Here's the link for it at the bottom here, which is a nice way to correlate CT with uh, infectivity. So what was done here is over 3,000 individuals uh, were studied and they were given uh, PCR tests similar to the one I've just described. And then the, the samples from their noses were placed on cells in culture in the laboratory to see if they contain any infectious virus. And that's what's shown on the graph. It's a little complicated, but let me walk you through it. So on the x-axis, we have the CT value going from 11 to 37, really high CT value, so not a lot of RNA, and 11, uh, a low CT value, quite a bit of RNA. So different CT values that they found in their patients. Uh, the number of samples for each CT that were studied, and you can see in the middle, they had a lot of samples, and at the ends, fewer. And then the number of positive, positive means infectious. When they put these nasal washes or nasal swabs on cell cultures, they could grow virus out of them. 36 and 37 CT values, they couldn't recover any uh, infectious virus in cells. So less RNA, less virus is recovered. Um, and then these lines indicate um, the number of culture positives as well. You can see 100% culture positive here at the low CT value, and then it's going down and down. As the CT values go up, the ability to recover virus goes down to, until it's zero at 36 and 37. So this is a study with thousands of patients, again, correlating CT value with uh, infectivity. And again, the key is you can easily recover infectious virus from CT values from 11 uh, up through 35-ish. But then 36 and 37, uh, there is no infectivity recovered. But this tells you why I wasn't worried at a CT of 34.5. All right, so what happened next? So I got this result on a Friday night. And so we rescheduled a new test. I went in the following Tuesday did the same procedure, anterior nares sampling. The sample was sent to the probe. The PCR was done in exactly the same way, and that one came back negative. So the moral of this story is, first of all, I had a false positive. I wasn't at the beginning of an infection because if I were, the second PCR would have shown an increase. In, uh, in other words, reflected by a lower CT value, going 34.7 to something lower. On the other hand, it was not, not likely that I had an asymptomatic infection because PCR result would not have turned negative in such a short period of time. So the conclusion is that this was a false positive test. Random testing of people only works if it's done often. One PCR test on its own is not informative, especially uh, in cases like mine uh, when the CT value is quite high. I hope that's useful for you to understand CT value, PCR, and the vagaries of testing. In the ideal world, everyone would be tested frequently, but of course, PCR is too expensive to do that. Um, and antigen tests, the Michael Mina approach is the way to do that. And we'll, I'll put a link to Michael Mina's TWIV where you can hear him talk about that. I'm Vincent Racaniello. I'm Earth's virology professor and I will see you on the next video.